LA huge announcement. I am shooting my special Wednesday, December 14th here in Los Angeles at the Dynasty Typewriter Theater. Go to ryansickler.com for tickets. Use code SICKLER. You're going to get half off tickets, all right? Please come out. I want the place packed. We're doing two shows, and uh, I want all the diehards there, all right? Screw the industry. This is for the fans. Go to ryansickler.com. Get your tickets today. Chicago, thank you so much for your support. Another great weekend. You guys are the fucking best. Grand Rapids, I'll see you all December 9th and 10th. Get your tickets to those shows and all shows on my website at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, and Ryan Sickler on all your social media. And I'm going to start this episode like I start almost all of them. And I want to say thank you for your support. Thank you for watching. If you are watching, just hit that subscribe button. It means everything to us. It's a huge help, and it's free. It doesn't cost you a damn dime. But you know what's not free? The Patreon. If you got to have more, then you got to subscribe to the Patreon. There's only one level. It's five bucks a month. There's not a bunch of tiers and all this bullshit. It's five bucks a month. It's called the Honeydew with y'all. And I highlight the lowlights with y'all. And y'all have the wildest fucking stories I've ever heard in my life. It's a show I can't stop talking about. When I talk to my friends, I'm like, you should hear this one about the guy that solved an 18-year-old cold case. You should hear the one about the chick with the two pussies. It's all on there. It's five bucks a month. If you sign up for a year, you're getting over a month free and you get the honeydew a day early. You get it ad free and you get it at no additional cost. All right. If I am in your city when you're around, come on out and see me on tour. Tickets are available at ryansickler.com. Chicago, November 11th and 12th, Grand Rapids. I'll be there December 9th and 10th. All right. That's the biz. You guys know what we're doing over here. We highlight the low lights. These are the stories behind the storytellers. I am very excited to have this guest on today. First time here on the Honeydew, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Jim Florentine. Welcome to the Honeydew, Jim. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having Thank you for being here. Yeah, man. Absolutely. We did an old crab feast that I still talk about, and I haven't seen you probably since. It's been years up there. I remember it was like you said a, it's a, three years since you've been out here. Yeah, right. So I yeah. think it was a, you, like, like your kitchen table or something yeah, in your might part. Be five or six years. Yeah, 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 dude. Um, well, welcome. Please, before we get into anything, plug and promote everything you want to get out there. My new comedy special, Bite the Bullets, on Amazon Prime. You can rent to buy it there. I got a new prank call CD called Terrorizing Telemarketers, Volume 7. <laughs> seven. Volume 7. It. I've been doing it for 20 years. I haven't grown up. Still making prank calls. <laughs> That's out. It was recently number one on the comedy charts. It was awesome. So wherever you listen to music, you get that. And I do a podcast called Everybody is Awful. It's out every Monday. And I'll be in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, November 4th and 5th. Hyenas Comedy Club. I'll be at the Key West Comedy Club in Key West, Florida, November 17th through the 20th. And Detroit, December 10th through the 12th at the House of Comedy. Oh, the house. I was going to say, that's newer, right? Yeah, they just opened it. Yeah, right. new club. Yeah. Because I'm wondering what the people hit me up all the time about why don't you come to Detroit? And I'm like, is there even a comedy scene in Detroit? I don't know. I, I don't know don't either. Know. I haven't done, I've done a couple of rock clubs there. So yeah. this is, this club just opened. So, All right. you know, so yeah, that's it. Um, well, we're going to talk about something that's going to be heavy. I'm going to tell people that at the, at the top now, because some people get upset that I don't give trigger warnings. <laughs> outside. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck everybody's going to say all the time, but yeah. you um, want to talk about a suicide, right? Yeah. Can we talk about of it? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, tell me everything. I had a girlfriend, you know, uh, well, first of all, I grew up uh, Catholic, so, you know, my mom. Suicide's not a thing. It's not a thing, but also, you know, I come from a family of seven kids. My mom basically was always, like, trying to save people. That was her thing. She was super religious. She could have been, like, the next Mother Teresa. She okay. would just take people in off the street. Anybody, let's take care of them. So that's all I knew. So when I, she's like, you got to take care of people. You got to have empathy if they're, okay. if they're damaged. You know, try to fix them, basically. And how old are you at the time you're dating this this girl? Uh, Mid thirties. Okay. So I I I I meet this girl. She was in a lot of trouble, like you know, craziness. You know, just some shady shit going on in her life. And you know, she's like, "Can I stay with you for a little bit?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And then basically, she never left. Adopted foster homes. 
molested, uh, just a horrible, horrible childhood. Awful. I felt bad for her, so I'm like, I can't, you know, she didn't have anybody to go to, no family, no nothing. So I'm like, yeah, stay with me. We became boyfriend and girlfriend together for six years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, we were six years in. You know, I just like, I knew she needed, she didn't have anybody else. So I'm like, she's just. She but really had nobody else. Nobody else. I mean, the adopted family kind of like turned on her. She, you know, she didn't know who her real parents were and all that stuff. But you had, you know, depression issues and all that. And I knew that going in. You know, and you think you could, you could solve that. You think, okay, I could fix this somehow. How old was she? She was, I was 35. She was probably like 25, 26, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. So, you, I mean, really young. Yeah, just like a little girl. You know yeah. what I mean? I just, I really felt, I just felt bad. And you're raised to to not turn your back on people like Don't that. Don't turn your back. And my mom and my whole family took her in because she was had nobody. Ask, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, they loved her. Yeah, all okay, right, so yeah. your mom sort of gave her a support system and all that. Too. Of course. And oh, she was yeah. like, wow, I really, I finally have a family. Okay. And I was like, well, how can I? And I knew it wasn't ultimately the right, you know, relationship. But I was like, what am I going to do? I'll get, I throw this girl out on the street. You know what I mean? She finally feels like she's part of a family. And Now, let they, me ask you, because I'm sure that guilt's playing on you, too. But why did you know it wasn't the right relationship? Because, you know, just, the, the you know, whether it was bipolar or depression issues, up and down, the highs and lows, it the craziness. It wasn't sustainable. It wasn't sustainable. And I like, you know, I, I'm a... I'm a low key, mellow guy. I don't need that craziness in my life. A fucking man. And then all of a sudden, stop it comes yelling in. at me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm like, look, I just, I'm just, you know, yeah. yeah, I don't want any part of that. And it was like, it was, you know, so I'm like, man, this is. Was she on meds or anything like that at the uh, time? Off and on here and there, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, you know, it got to the point, maybe, I don't know, year four or five, she was like, you know, she always mentioned, you know, I wish I could just go to sleep and never wake up again. She would. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I, you know, when you don't know anything about suicide, it's almost like you think they're just, it's a cry for help. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they're just saying, I wish I could, I would just kill myself and then I, get, I don't have to worry about anything. And you're like, come on, you know, everybody loves you. That's, why would you say that? People care about you, but they don't want to hear that. And that's actually a sign when people actually start talking about it, you think they're just looking for attention, but that means they're really thinking about it. Is that it. right? That's and the I didn't know at the time. Of, okay. I had no clue. This is something they should teach everybody, you know, a friend or whatever like that. Cause you think, oh, see, they need attention again. What is it now? You know, whatever, like, but meanwhile, they're really hurting inside. So I got to the point about year five. I said, listen, I got to, I got to, her adopted family basically disowned her. She hated them anyway. They tortured her growing up or whatever. So I said, I got to. Isn't fu that fucking crazy? I don't mean to interrupt. Insane. But to adopt a child and then to treat them like shit. Like, what the fuck? It, I, was, it makes no sense. It to was me. like this Mennonite uh, Amish, like okay. he was the pastor. So they adopted all these kids. These black and Asian, all these different color kids to go, hey, look at us. We're in the community. Look, we adopted all these kids. And meanwhile, a complete nightmare. You see those documentaries on yeah. like Netflix. I, d I just watched that Mormon one. Uh, right, yeah. Yeah. So they, they think, oh, they're a pillar of community. Look what they did. They brought all these people together. They, they're not just white kids. And look at they got, you know, oh, yeah, they're great. And meanwhile, it's just, you know, what's going on, the way they're raising them and shit like that. So it really messed with her. So I was like, I got to find your real mom. Cause may I, cause I know, oh, wow. okay. I said, cause I go, maybe she can, you know, uh, develop a relationship with her and then maybe I can hand her off to her and you know, she could live a good life. Now do you tell her you're looking for her real mom? Yeah, and She okay. didn't want me to. She goes, what if she rejects me again? Then what do I do? Yeah, that's gotta be tough. I mean, thank God I come from a loving family, but if my mom, if I got, you know, put up for adoption and I try to find my real mom and I find her and she rejects me again, that's gotta be devastating. Like I didn't want you in the first place. I didn't like, want you in the fuck. first place. So I said, Real Listen, quick, your dad, was he around? Yeah, he was uh he wasn't around at this point. My okay. parents were married thirty three years. He passed away probably five years before that. All right, but he was just as all in on bringing people in and helping them and stuff like that uh, or, or it was yeah, more your mom pretty right? much yeah well yeah, he's he just like went man now i gotta buy more fucking groceries yeah, yeah, right. he already had work. for seven he's like now i got fucking time. 12 people living here you gotta be kidding me <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah shit, he's like shit now, yeah, yeah he's, and this is before costco and <laughs> yeah, bj's yeah, where you can buy yeah, bulk yeah, shit right. he's like yeah how get, many toilets did you have in your house what? Three. All right, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it was a two and a half. Yeah, I was gonna say for seven of you had to at least have. No, more we, than we, one. it was me and my two older brothers in a bunk bed, and we had a bed like you know on the floor, basically mm -hmm. like a cot. So that was our room. 
And then the girls had their own room. Two of them, one of them had it. So it was, you know. Yeah. But it was cool. It was, we grew up in a great community, had a lot of friends, all that stuff. So, uh, you know. But yeah, he was just like, God damn, all these people, they're sleeping on the couches, this and that. My mom's like, give up your bunk. I'm like, I'm not giving up my bunk. <laughs> yeah. Come yeah. on. <laughs> what else I got to do? So, um, so we ultimately find, I op- ultimately find her real did. mom. Yeah. How'd you do that? Um, s- the adopted mom still had a contact what's fucking crazy is the adopted mom would tell, cause she's like during her, her childhood and growing up, she's like, I want to meet my real mom. I want to see if she has any health conditions, maybe some yeah, hereditary I, shit. And she's like, your real mom doesn't want to see you. She doesn't she like say that. Oh yeah, man. Fucking crazy. But she had a contact from a pastor who gave her away or whatever like that. So and she, you were in touch with the adopted family. I, we'd see him once in a while, okay. you know, I feel attention. We try to like, and she's like, I hate him. I go, let's just hang with them, whatever. So she knew that she had that piece of paper with that contact on it, but she would make up these stories. Your mother doesn't want to see you. She hates you. Your mother's a prostitute. She's uh, she had a crack. She had a crack baby. She was living on the street and she's like, Oh man, like, you know, and I went to adopt him. I go, look, I need that number. She's like, no. And I'm like, I, I gotta, I want to find a real mom. She goes, I'm not giving it to you. And I'm like, listen, you better fucking give me that. Cause she was c- trying to cover up all these lies. Mm. When we ultimately found their mom, none of that happened. She Is wasn't right? crack babies, wasn't addicted to drugs. What was she? She was a normal woman living in Orange County. That what, just had a young she, baby? She came and- over, she was Vietnamese. She came over okay. during the war and the father stayed back or whatever. And she came with the baby and she couldn't, she didn't know what to do. She couldn't speak English. The church goes here, give her up the church where my, uh, you know, the uh, um, adopted place goes, mm-hmm. give her up. We'll take care of the baby. You can see her or whatever. So she gave the baby up. She didn't know what, she had to go to work. So you find this woman and she's living in Orange County. You t- we're talking about uh, New York, Orange County. No, not no, Orange here. County. Uh, oh, California. California? Yeah, oh, yeah. no shit. Okay, yeah. so she's out here. Yeah. And then what do you fly out to meet her? We you fly out to meet her. Is and is your girlfriend? Can we? Is it okay to mention her name? Yeah, Jade. Okay, so Jade is she like? I don't want to do this, or is she then like, holy shit, you found her? I'm all in. She was on the fence. She wanted to, but then she was, like I said, afraid that she was going to get rejected from her. And how was the mom when you talked to her? Was she excited about meeting her daughter? Super excited. She was. We talked to her on the phone. She's like, oh, my God, you have a brother. You have a sister. Oh, you got shit. all these cousins. They're, they all lived in that little community. Dude, so here's the whole family. Oh, and they were all there? They were all there. You know, that little community there. So they were all living there. So we fly in LAX, we go, we drive out there, we meet them. She meets everybody. It was unbelievable. Yeah, what's that like? There were just, you know, there was like 30 of them. Like, were you emotional watching that? Yeah, because yeah, I was like, man. Be awesome to see this You know, because I come from a good family, and I right. know, you know, and it's just like, she finally, it was, you know, they were waiting for her as we pulled in the driver. Oh, hell like yeah. 25 of them. Oh, I got chills. Hell I know, yeah. man. It was That's unbelievable. That's cool. Yeah, so we hang, we're talking. This one, she's showing pictures. This is when you were a baby. I saw, she never saw those baby pictures. You know, and then I take the stepdad aside when this is all going on. I go, hey, listen, this is what the adopted mom said, that, you know, she was a crack baby. She was drug addict living on the streets. She's like, she's been working for like, you know, some local company for 25 years, you know, whatever. So all that was lies. The adopted mother didn't want her to meet the real mom. She Because the adopted mother was like controlling. So, hey, I'm not going to let you meet your real mom because then you might leave me. And, right. I, and I raised you. Right. So... Um, you know, we got to dinner, we had a big connection. Like two months later, they come to the East coast in New Jersey, spent Christmas with and us. Who's they? Who comes? Her mom, her real mom, the stepdad, and a couple of her cousins and sisters. Wow. Holy shit. They all came. Your yeah. dad's like, how many of them are fun? No, my dad, my dad wasn't <laughs> no, around. My dad joking. wasn't around. Oh yeah. He would have been like, you gotta be fun. <laughs> be like 12 more. Well, no, now they stayed in my place. Now I got to feed them. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> it's your turn. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't want to go to Chipotle either. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I'm living outside of New York city. They're like, come on, we want to go. I'm like, fuck is killing me and then i gotta pay for them yeah. my girl's like come on don't make them pay they don't have a lot of money i'm like fine so i'm taking them to these nice restaurants or whatever so they spent christmas with us you know and then they you know had a good relationship we come out a lot visit them she'd come see him whatever like that i'm like all right good she's in good hands now she has some support system around there but ultimately that didn't work either how long did that did about every- a year year and a half okay a year year and a half and did she ever meet her real father no, the real no. father stayed back, maybe He's like Japan or something. Okay. Yeah, so she never met him. So that didn't help, huh? It ultimately didn't help. So what happens? What do you see happen over? Like, are they visiting each other back and forth for a little while? They're visiting. They- they're talking on the phone. All this other stuff. Okay. But it, you know, um, 
you know, just, you know, with that, with depression, you don't know, you don't know. And you know, when someone's suicidal, it could start. She always said, she goes, I would say it in grade school, I want to kill myself. I'm like, who would say that in grade school? You know, she goes, I'm in the seventh, eighth grade. I always think that, you know, so it was always there. I just thought this was really going to help it. And she was doing really well. She had the connection, but then, you know, ultimately it, she, you know, did this the highs and lows. And I remember her telling, she told her sister, that I'm thinking about killing myself, and her sister called me because I I didn't even see it. I thought she was in a good good. Now this good is spot. her sister who she's just met over yeah. the last year. Yeah, so she calls me. She goes, "You you better check on her." She told me this, and I I went to. Her, I go, "Did you say that?" She goes, "Well, I was just having a bad moment." I go, "What do you mean?" You know, I couldn't understand. I'm like, thought everything was good. I don't know. I'm still a fucking idiot when it comes to this. I'm thinking everything's solved, the problem solved. You know, as a guy, you just want to fix it. Right. It's fixed, right? Oh, let's move on. Yeah. And then. uh you know, one night, um, she just, um, she was going to go to a show with me. I was open for dice mm -hmm. at the time. It was like a local show. And she's like, I go, you want to go? She goes, no, I'm, I'm not feeling that well. I'm just going to stay home. I go, all right. I mean, she goes, can you take your, we had a little dog. She goes, can you take your dog to my mom's house? My mom was like on the way. And I'm like, why? Well, she goes, I'm just not feeling well. I go, well, you know, so the dog's not going to bother you. The dog's just going to lay with you. She goes, you can't take her. I go, no, it's kind of out of the way. I go, I don't want, because then I got to pick her up on the way back. Goes, All right, fine. So then, you know, I'm in the middle of doing it. So ultimately what my girl did, as soon as I left, she drove to my mom's house, like 45 minutes away and dropped the dog off. She did. Yeah. And my mom's like, what's going on? She goes, Oh, Jim said to drop the dog off. He's going to pick her later. My mom's like, okay, I don't know why. All right, no problem. Cause my mom will watch the dog. We're away. She didn't want the dog there when she did it. I think, you know, she mm -hmm. was like, the dog's going to, you know, so she didn't, I don't know. I don't know what was going through her mind at the time. All I know is I'm on stage at this theater and in the middle of my show, I I feel it's like jolt go through me. No. I swear to God. I'm like, I, I almost, I felt like I got electrocuted like halfway through the set. I'm like, what the hell was that? I thought it was from the stage, some, you know, shock or something like that. And then when I get off stage, she left a voicemail on my phone. It's like, I got to be out of pain. I'm sorry. I'm doing this, but no way. Yeah. Please don't, you know, forgive me. Go on, live your life, whatever. I'm, I'm really sorry. Just know it's not you. It's me. You walk off stage and grab your phone. And Cause she never calls like to. a why? Cause I saw a voicemail from her. I'm like, why is she call? She knows I'm working. Like we would just talk when we get home. Maybe she would text me, but I see a voicemail. I'm like, that's weird. I didn't listen to it right away either. Cause I was like, all right, I was talking after the show, I had the adrenaline going or whatever. And about 15, 20 minutes later, I go, let me see what you, what, what you wanted. And I hear this. So, you know, I, uh, and how far away are you from home where this venue is? 30 minutes. Fuck. Yeah. And then I call my mom and she goes, well, she dropped the dog off. And I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Is that when you like, that's like, what this I, yeah. is real? Yeah, because she's done this before. She goes, you know, and I'm like, stop, I'll be home in a little while. Like, just not, not, not like that, but she's just like, I'm having a bad moment. I don't know. I'm like, relax, I'll be home in an hour. I'll, you know, I'll take care of you. We'll be fine. So I was hoping it was like this. But then again, when she dropped the dog off, I'm like, that's, that's not good. And then, you know, I come to my apartment and, um, you know, I found her in this bad bedroom. Oh. How'd she do it? Pills, Pills and booze. And you found her where? Was she laying in bed? Laying on the floor. On the floor. Yeah. Face down? Face up. It's just something you never... Like, I had to give my grandmother CPR and shit, and then she <sighs> passed away. It's just something that'll it'll, never... It'll haunt you. I'm that not, image, I can I could trace it. You know what I mean? Like, I know you know that position and that that still is burned in your fucking brain. My dad died of a heart attack in front of all of us one Saturday morning. We were there trying to give him CPR. I'm standing, watching it. How old are you? I was 28 at the time. And you're watching him die in front of you? Yeah. I mean, my mom woke me up. I did something's wrong with your dad. And we all went upstairs waiting for the, you know, the ambulance to come and all that stuff. You know, and they took him away and we thought he was going to be okay. And then we go to the hospital. I was like, no. And I saw that. And then, well, what happened was it was like a few years, it was a few days before New Year's, I remember. So, we were gonna go out for New Year's Eve or something. So I remember coming in the, coming in the, the apartment and panicked and I ran into our bedroom and she wasn't in there, but I saw the dress on the bed that she picked out and I looked, there was a note on it. And I look at the note and she goes, this is the dress I won't be wearing on New Year's Eve. Oh, Jesus. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. So then I go down the hallway to our spare bedroom, which you know we just had a bed in there for anyone to stay over and the door was shut. And that's not normal? Not normal. 
and then I walked in and she was laying there. How long do you know how long she had been dead? I don't know. Did you try to go over and see if she was still breathing? Of course, I started giving her mouth to mouth. I called 911, started giving her mouth to mouth. You know, they got over there pretty quick. And they were like, you know, listen, just, you know, we're trying. I I thought maybe she was, I didn't know. I felt no pulse, but I'm, you know, you're still thinking there's got to be, she'll be all right. When it happened to me, I was trying to check my father's pulse, but my heart was racing so hard. I couldn't fucking tell if I was getting a pulse or my heart was about to explode. You right. know what I mean? Like there's so many things. Right. And you mind. think oh, it's going to, they're going to be fine. Gonna, yeah. My dad, my dad wasn't moving for a while. I'm like, no, they're going to be fine. They took him away. They put the oxygen. I'm like, all right, so he's going to, he's going to live this. And then you get there like, no, it, he was, and they told us, they go, he died right away. He was not in pain. Like as soon as it happened, you know, but you, when, when that's going on, you're, you're thinking all these crazy thoughts, right. you know, then all of a sudden, you know, as this is going on, you know, the cops come this, and that, then all of a sudden you're, you're considered a suspect. Right, because I they didn't don't think know of that. Yeah, you know what I mean. I'm the boyfriend. But wait, so you're you call nine one one, and then the paramedics show up. Yeah, and are they treating her? Are they like doing the clear? They, or I, they she kept me already, out of the room. Oh, I didn't want to go in there. Once they came, I go. She's there. I couldn't look. I couldn't. What I walked in was a nightmare, so I couldn't get back. Go back in there, and then the cops come. Are you crying at this point, or I'm are you just shocked? shocked? I'm in complete. Yeah, 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 at first I was, but then it's just like you're you're yeah. you're like what? Yeah, complete shock. And then the cops like, whoa, okay, get out, get out of the apartment, like wait in the hallway. And they're like, okay, so they were questioning me. I'm like, and they're like, hey, we just want to bring you, you know, to the local police station. Yeah, when did it dawn on you, like, holy shit, I'm a suspect? You know, when my when my family showed up and they're like, my brother's a lawyer. He's like, I goes, I think they they're gonna have to question you. I go about what? He's like, they're gonna have to question. I'm like, holy shit. So the cops like, hey, listen, I'm gonna drive. You guys, family wants to follow us back to the police station. I'm gonna drive with Jim. We're gonna go up there. Just ask. We gotta fill fill out a for you know uh, a statement. And I'm like, and I'm driving. I'm like, oh my god, is this like? Because they always go to the boyfriend. They don't know. They don't know exactly what happened. It was just she was just laying there. So it could have been me or whatever. So and you're the one who found her. So I'm the one who found her. Yeah. I call, you know, and then you know they sat there and talked to me, and I said, here, here's the voicemail. Yeah. And, and the, the voicemail. Note. Then then she left a note. She left notes for me all around the apartment, which oh, I didn't. More well, than that, one, yeah, you know, a, a goodbye note. You know, they found that, and then also, you know, and then I played them the voicemail. Say, like, okay, but you know, I didn't even know. Like I'm sitting there with the two detectives, and they're just talking to me and about this what happened. I'm like, man, this could. They could be like, listen, man, we're gonna have to hold you. I didn't even know. You're in such shock. You know, ultimately they go, okay, fine. And then they knew, you know, when I showed them all that stuff, but it was like, and then, you know, for the next month, I think the police are going to come to my house. Cause I'm like, am I, you know, am I a suspect? But then they, they said, listen, we found the notes. We obviously know she left them all over the place and all that, the voicemail. So that's a whole other level you got to worry about. Yeah. I didn't even think of that, that you're being looked at for possible murder. Yeah. <sighs> it was brutal. And you're going through legit trauma from the suicide and now you got to worry about murder suspect and I, yeah and i drive to the police station with the cop in the front seat with them we're just talking you know whatever like that i'm like I, this is weird my dad my brother's like hey man just you know tell him exactly what happened I go, of course i will you know it was it was uh it was rough man it was uh can i show a question what's that what'd you do with the dress what'd you do with the notes i still have the notes you have all of them the last ones yeah. You do? Yeah. Do you ever the dress, look at them? Once in a while, I will. Once in a while, I will. And, it, you know, it made me feel better because she's like, listen, um, you gave me the best, best six years of, of my life, and I would have done this way before if I didn't meet you. So just know that, that's, you know. That's actually, it's, I mean, that's bittersweet right there. Yeah, she it? goes to just know you gave me the best six years, and it's the, I, I'm out of pain now. I was in pain. Just go live your life. Be happy. But, you know, when I read that, it didn't make sense to me because you're angry. Right. Like, why'd you do this to me? You think it's, you know, why'd you do to, to Why'd me. you make me? Yeah. You knew I was going to find you. You know what I mean? I had to walk in. And you're, you're, there's all, you've got a roller coaster of emotions. You're sad, obviously. You're angry. Like, what the fuck? All this stuff I did for you, it still wasn't good enough. Meanwhile, I don't know anything about depression and suicide. I learned that out later when I'm starting to heal, you know? So, and, you, and then, and then, you know, God forbid you smile five days later or something makes you, then you're guilty because you're like, how can I laugh? Right. How can so I feel can, shame on me for feeling good? Right for now. feeling good. You mm-hmm. you feel guilty about feeling good. You're like, how can I do this when this just happened? All of this stuff. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Well, so you're also now the fucking linchpin of this whole thing. So now do you have to call her 
brand new mom. I mean, not brand new mom, but the connection. You just have to call these people now and be like, hey, she did that. You're the one that has to notify everybody. Yep. Jesus, dude. I had a, a so who do you have to call? Who are you calling? The adopted family. Oh, I called yeah. Them. I forgot about them. They gotta, Did they care? What was their reaction? Um, they pretended they cared, and then they wanted all our stuff, you know, because she had some, you know, designer bags. They really asked for that shit? Oh, He's fucking, I'm telling you, man. The Death. vultures, when they come, when someone dies, that's people it. come out of the woodwork, That's man. when you find out who the real pieces of shit in the family are. Absolutely. You know, the vultures come out. Yeah. They really do. Get my, my uncle took my father's camera. I'm like, hey, can I get a camera? Can I get his camera? Like, I don't even have a dad. Can I get his camera? He's like, right. nah, it's, it's a good camera. I'm going to keep it. And then, you know, then I just, I'm, you know, 16, so I'm pissed off about Something dumb like a fucking camera. Right. It's more about what this asshole did, but and now there's fucking cameras on phones. Sometimes you just gotta wait it out. You know it's what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you just gotta wait. My phone camera's better than my dad's old camera. <laughs> right. I wouldn't be using that shit anyway. But I remember I remember um they were like there was, you know, my it was we had a little dog, one of those little Yorkies, like the Paris Hilton, and my girl mm. used to always have it in a bag, a little dog bag. And they were like afterwards, like, that was a Louis Vuitton bag. Where is that bag? Meanwhile, it was like a Hello Kitty bag from the Hello Kitty store. It was like a $10 bag. He sold that. We, we wanted, he's stealing, you know, my daughter's stuff. You know, that was a designer. She met the dog once, like my girl brought up. That was Louis Vuitton. It was a $2,500 dog bag. We looked it up. Where's that bag? Like all of the shit, all these accusations and stuff like that. I was in lawsuits with them. Lawsuits? Oh, they yeah. went that far with it? Well, because we also own the place together. We were okay. both on the title to the condo that so we So now own. they want half your oh, fucking absolutely. place? absolutely. Fuck that, dude. Oh, really? They were, they were coming for everything. Oh, coming to everything. Everything. Man. You know, and there was a there was a thing and then the agreement when we you know like if someone passed away usually you sign it over to the person that's still alive mm -hmm. and we forgot to check that box because we both agreed on that. I go, hey, listen, if something happens to one of us. You know, you got the place, so you're you're covered. I'm covered, and we've got that. So then I was in a lawsuit with them for like two years, but yeah. I never went back after that day when I found her in that place. I told my mom, I go, listen, I can't go, I can't walk back in there. Oh, so you own that condo, and I then you it. had to walk away from it. I said I can't go back in there. A nightmare where I walked in. I lived with my mom for a year and a half after that. Did you really? Yeah, I was like 41 years old at the time. Something like that. I mean, man. I said, I need to be taken care of. Because I, I would go into therapy at the time. He goes, you need to be taken care of. Go back with your family. He goes, who cares? So best what? Best place to be. Your mom's taking everybody That was the best place to be. In, she was, yeah. My sister lived with her. There was room there. And I'm like, I need this. I need to be around family and friends. So I was living like 45 minutes away. Yeah. And I, I can't be isolated in this place where this happened. I can't walk in there this every, every night. Every day and sleep there and shit. Forget it. I, I, I only went back one time when I sold the place. Like two years later, I walked through. And that was it. And that was even tough to do. So it just sat for two years. It sat until for two you were years because I was in a, a whole thing with the ex, with the family, the, you know, so the lawsuits and all stuff. And then we ultimately sold it. And they had to fuck off. Well, I had to cut them a nice check. You did? Oh, yeah, because it wasn't that check, that box wasn't checked. So according to the law, the other family gets half. So we had to fight back and oh, forth. Oh, fuck. Dude, I would have I would have I would have fucking gave them everything to just get out of my life. I hear you on that. Though. You know, I do hear you on that. Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual, so when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. I'm a huge believer in therapy. Um, you know, I, it's great. Go work your muscles out. You need to do that, but work that mind out too. Work out everything going on inside you. It's awesome to talk to someone and get it out. And sometimes you just need it. You just need it. Okay. It helps. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with the therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Honeydew. That's BetterHelp. H E L P dot com slash honeydew. Have you started shopping for the holidays yet? No? Why not? You know, most gifts don't go bad, right? Right now, you can shop early and snag some of the best deals of the season on something everyone will love premium audio products 
from Raycon. When you're looking for a gift everyone needs, Raycons are the way to go. Their wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer premium sound, useful features, an almost custom comfortable fit, and up to 54 hours of battery life. As the person gifting them, you'll love that they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. Plus, Raycon makes it easy with holiday gift guides for everyone in your life. You can even knock that list out all at once and get 30% off by shopping Raycon's holiday bundles. Everyone needs a pair of Raycons in their ears, whether it's for listening to music, taking work calls, or catching the Ravens game on the go. You can find Raycon in stores now, like Kohl's or Walmart, but let me tell you right now, you're always going to get the best deal when you use my special link, buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Right now, go to buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Use the code early. BF. That's E A R L Y B F to get 20% off site wide. That's 20% off any Raycon product, which almost never happens. Or save even bigger and get 30% off Raycon's exclusive holiday bundles. That's code E A R L Y B F at buyraycon.com slash honeydew for 20% off your Raycon purchase. Buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Now, Let's get back to the do. What, um, all right. Well, that was the adopted family's reaction. How was her mom? And just very indifferent. Really? Did not you know, blown away or not blown away. And well, that's surprised. I didn't think you'd say that. Never, never came to the funeral. No. Yep. Never came. Really? Yeah. After they had just, they were connected on vacation. Bon- they oh. were on vacation. So I was like, you know, can't let, can't cut short their vacation. For their own child that they just reconnected with, who they I'm missed fucking for real, all. Man. I mean, man. So now you know where this, the, the pain that this girl yeah. was in, the, the the craziness. She's been surrounded by shit. Surrounded by shit. I mean, you know, they still were in a good relationship, her and her mom. But for some, I don't know, maybe the mom felt guilty. Who knows? When it, when it's a suicide, it's a whole other death. It's not cancer. It's not a car accident. There's a million different questions, a million emotions. You don't know how to handle it. So I, I, I don't blame her for not, like, I wasn't mad. I'm like, okay, you're not going to come. You're not gonna, maybe she didn't want to see the adopted mom, all that stuff. So mm-hmm. who knows what was going on? Who knows the crazy past? So so do you have a, a funeral? You're also in charge of all the funeral shit, too? Yeah. God damn, dude. It's all on you, huh? And it's funny because she put in her note, she goes, whatever you do, don't bury me in that town where my adopted family's from. I don't want to. Be, I don't want to be near them. Please bury me near your family, like in New Jersey. And I saw that in a note. And I didn't want to tell the adopted family that. I was like, I can't tell them that because we were still on good terms at the time, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm like, I'm not going to say it. So today, said, Hey, can we bury her in our town or the other family? I go, Yeah, that's fine, you know. And then ultimately did. But then, you know, I should have. And then, you know, then they, you know, they all of a sudden they, where's the Louis Vuitton bag? Where's all this bullshit? You know, when it ever comes to items or money or all that stuff. So I never told them that. I should have, but I was like, how am I going to tell this family? Hey, listen, by the way, she hated you and she doesn't want to be. So I just let, I go, I'm not going to tell them that. So she's buried in that town where she don't want to be buried. Yeah. I didn't listen to him. <laughs> I didn't listen to her. I, I didn't mean, listen, listen to her. You did a lot. I know. Her. I know. I, 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 I go, you, you know what? A thousand, I go, I'm bro. sorry if she's mad, but you know, I'm mad too because I got to fucking deal with this now. So no, we'll just, I go, no, nah, I can't do that to that family. Yeah. But then when we were in litigation. Right. I told, it's like you should have. When yeah. we were in litigation, I told the brother, he was called me yelling at me. I go, yeah, well, I'm going to read you right from her note. I don't want to be buried near them, but you know, whatever. So he's like, yeah, yeah she didn't write that. I go, okay. Yeah, whatever. So. So they didn't really know how much she disliked them, the adopted family? I think they kind of knew, but, you know, they pretended like everything was fine. But they wanted a couple hundred dollar bag. or uh, I mean, imagine that. I, they're that, everything. I had the same thing happen to me. My grandmother dies. My dad had already died. We have an uncle and his wife and his kids come in. They shut her door. They lock it. My grandmother's sisters are beating on the door like they want they want some keepsakes. And they're like, nope, they fucking took it all in trash bags, drug it down the steps and went right out of the house. And we're like, we're all sitting here mourning the death of this woman. I right. had to give her CPR. You know, it's fucked up. Yeah. And here you are coming for jewelry and whatever else. So I remember she had this one fake. It was like a little CZ ring, you know, cubic. And um, 
I found it and I purposely took it down to my cousin's house. They had like a little cookout or something. And I went there and I was like, look at this shit I found in Grant. And they were like, give it to me. And they came snatching. Really? I was like, oh, oh, oh no. Yeah. I mean, it was worth like $20, right, but yeah. it looked like of course. it was worth 20000 You know what I mean? And they were like trying to get it and everything else. And I was like, nah, and I've never talked to those people ever again. Yeah. It's amazing how they come out of woodwork. You know, look at my family, like my grandmother died, my mom died. You know, we, we just basically, okay, this is what it is. Okay, it has a little money here. You have a good family. And I, yeah. I remember my grandmother died. Like, you know, she had a lot of stuff. And I, I was like, all right, listen, I don't want an antique table from 1954. I don't care about these 1960 forks that are silver or rare. She had a, a handicap placard for her car that never expired. I go, I want that. <laughs> Because I could park at concerts right in the front. Yeah, you can. And Anywhere I, I, you in want. In the handicap, and I'm hanging tailgate, and I can hear when the band goes on. And that's the only time I use it. I don't use it when I go to the supermarket. I understand that. But there's like 75 a handicap right in the front of the venue. Yeah. And that's the only time I pull it out. That's all I wanted. I go... They're like, that's it. I got that's it. I don't care about that's anything real. else. That's and I still have it to this day. Do you really? Oh, yeah. Does it still work? It's still, yeah, because it's, it's like it, a life. It, it never one? expires. Ah, uh -huh, is that right? Yeah, so I just hang it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going, I, I did it 10 times this summer at the concert venue near my house. I'm right in the front. I'm in handicapped. <laughs> that's fucking crazy. That's the only time I pull it out. <laughs> only time. And then that's the most valuable thing. <laughs> It's the best. It has saved you a lot of money. In that same, it's, it's, yeah, I, I want to be up front. I'm not, <laughs> you're right there. I'm not a spoil, but I just like to hang. And I, you know, uh, this is where we're going to meet. And so yeah, good. I hear the band. All right, the band's on. Let's go. Let's go in. Because you can hear it's an outdoor yeah, venue. It's right a pavilion. There. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's all I want. I still have. And I hide uh, it. Like, I think like a valet guy is going to see it in my glove compartment. Steal it. Steal it. Yeah. yeah. So I lock my glove compartment. I only give them the other parts that I can't get in. Sometimes I'll stick it under a spare tire in the back in my trunk because mm -hmm. I'm so petrified that someone's going to take that. I love that, that. That's a keepsake. That's all I want. It's also a keepsake. It is a keepsake. I'm like, thank you, Grandma. <laughs> yeah. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in front row Every again. Time. Thank you. I can walk right in. Thank you, Grandma. <laughs> That's definitely a way to keep someone's <laughs> and spirit did, alive. I know. And she just shaking her head like, of course. Of course, that's what you would do. <laughs> oh, it's so good, dude. <laughs> all right. So... You mentioned um, you needed to be taken care of. All right. So we have funeral, everything happens, and now you go right to living with your mom and you do you start therapy right away. Does someone suggest it or are you just like, I fucking need to talk to somebody? Right away, I go online. I start reading about suicide. I realize, you know, it's a lifelong of pain. And in that moment, they just want to be out. I'm going to interrupt you one second. Yeah. Sorry. How old was she when she finally passed? 30. Man, that's a fucking baby. 30 I know. years old. A baby. Jesus Christ. Sorry, go ahead. So yeah. you start looking everything up. And it's, you know, in that moment when someone's thinking about doing that, they're only thinking of being out of pain. They can't see any other way out of whatever situation. They're not thinking Jim's going to be devastated by this. Nope. All these people are They feel be like they're a burden. If I'm gone, I'm a burden. People are going to be happy. Oh, thank God she was a pain in the ass. That's how people are suicidal think. Because people have, have um, you know, unsuccessfully tried, I've said in that moment, I just want to be out of pain. I didn't care who found me. I didn't care about anyone else. They're going to be better off without me. They always think they're going to be better off without me. Yeah. I just was talking to someone we watched. I saw that, um, it was a documentary about the guy that jumped off the golden gate bridge yeah. and he lived. Yep. And he said, as soon as his foot left, he regretted it immediately. And yep. he ended up just being a lucky one because I think there's only a few that have lived from that fall. That yep. fall alone will kill you. Yeah. Yeah, because um, it's like I, you hit like cement, but that yeah. high up when you hit the water, yeah. And I had a friend of mine. Um, he was a, I was really close to his brother, but he was his younger brother, and we were all tight. And he hung himself. And the thing that still sticks in my mind is that they said they found fingernail marks all on his neck. Like he, <sighs> he, he had hung himself. So when he jumped. He didn't realize right then, I don't want to fucking do this. But he had done it so well, he couldn't fucking save himself. And he died hanging with marks on his Brutal. neck. And that's what I think about all the time. Like, that guy didn't really want to fucking go. No, because, you, and, you, and you know, sometimes when it happens, someone loses a job or they're going over off a breakup. Sure. And, or they got, you know, they, they have to file bankruptcy. And, like, it's, and they, to us, it's like, all right, that's a setback in our life, but we'll figure it out. To them, it's, there's no, they can't see any other way out of it. Right. So that when that moment, that's all they're thinking about is being. And I'm pain. doing everyone a favor here. Not I'm doing just everybody me. a favor. I did okay. people are going to be happy that I'm gone and not a burden. 
anymore. And that's what they think. So I start looking it up. I'm learning about it. And I found these support groups, survivors of suicide. It was almost like an AA meeting. Okay. So it's at the local hospital right down the street every Tuesday night. So I start going in them right away. Good for you, dude. I had to because, you know, I, I never dealt my father's death at 28. I didn't deal with it right away. I was in shock. You know, obviously, I, you know, it was mourning, but I never really felt it. Mm-hmm. Cause it was just like, I don't know, I was in my twenties. I just, you know, I was an idiot back then. I didn't, you know, I cared about, I was doing stand up at the time, three years of my career, four years, whatever. I'm not, that's all I want. I mean, I, I obviously I took some time off, but I, I never dealt with it. I said, this thing could linger on forever if I don't deal with it right now. So I need to I take this thing head on. So I was going right down there every week, every Tuesday, a nice community. We're talking to each other on the phone and sitting in and hearing everyone's story. And what was good, because you would see someone that would came in that their, their son did it three years ago. And she, we talk about it the three years, my son did. And I'm like, wow. And they, they look like they were okay. And I'm like, I know I can get to that point. You know, someone nine months, I'm only a month in, someone nine months is feeling better. You know, nine months ago, my son did so. I'm like, all right, in eight months, I could, I could actually, because you don't think you think you're never gonna feel better. Right. This is always gonna be, you're gonna feel like fucking death the rest of your life or what happened. So that helped a lot too, just knowing that they were ahead of me and what was gonna happen, and eventually I'm gonna slowly start healing. You know, and then, um, you know, and then I, I probably like nine months after, I used to go on Howard Stern show all the yeah, time. Yeah, no, yeah. I, um. And he had me in and we told the story. He knew her too, because I bring her on the show and stuff like that. So I told the whole story basically. And then I heard, I probably got a hundred different emails from people around the country. The same thing happened to them. They didn't know how to deal with it. I told my thing. So we had a whole community of us just oh, that's talking nice. on the phone. Yeah. I'd go meet them when I come to town in Phoenix or whatever. Let's go have lunch. They come to my show, all that stuff. It helped me because I was about nine months in. It helped me to help these people at two months go, this is what's going to happen you know, whatever, or just happened and I never dealt with it. I'm like, this is what you should do. Go to those support group meetings, learn about it, you know, all that stuff. Go on the suicide walks, whatever, you know, help raise money, awareness and all that, you know. So that helped me just heal from it too. And then ultimately I just, I knew, I really thought my career was over at that point. Cause I remember, Why? cause for like six months, I couldn't come up with one joke. Wow. You know, I probably went back on tour maybe two months after. I'm like, I gotta get, I, you know, as a comic, you gotta get on stage. That's my life. I got, I don't know anything else. So, but I couldn't come up with any material at all. I wasn't going to talk about it. It was way too soon, obviously. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a tough thing to talk about, but I just could I had writer's block. I'm like, I'm going on the road doing the greatest hits. I'm like, man, I don't, you know, am I ever going to write anything again? And then ultimately the floodgates, I did a one man show about the whole thing. It was called I'm your savior. Oh, you did. Yeah. I filmed it and, and it's out there or whatever. So I did a whole one man show with slideshow and talked about the whole story and all that stuff. So that helped me get through it, but I can only do it about 20 times. I did the show. And because I couldn't every night after I, I was, it was, it was exhausting. You're reliving a suicide. Brutal. Every I could every time. night up there on stage yeah. and I felt it every time. And I was like, I got it. I can't shoot. I can't do this anymore. So I filmed it and then that was it. You know, I just got it out there. I was hoping maybe it could help some people understand it because no one understands this. Mm-hmm. You know, they just, like I said, they just think, okay, you'll be fine. They'll cry for help. But it's not, you know. And when someone's like that, you got a friend like that, you really got to go back to their family. Your family's got to go take care of them. You got to contact the family. So listen, just like an alcoholic or a drug addict, you got to go, hey, man, I'm hanging out with my friend. He's doing drugs. He's going to die. You got to, you know, just want to let you know what's going on. So that's what people have to do. And then hopefully the family can, you know, can get whether a medication or, you know, a yeah, facility or something that like would that. talk like that. And um, I called his mom and she um, she was like, thank you so much. And, I, and he's... I mean, I don't know if he's fine now, right. but he's alive. Yeah, you yeah. know what I'm saying? He's still here. Yeah. I don't know what torture he's going through or not these right. days. But, you know, but they can get out of it. You know, they can, w- working on it and stuff like that through, you know, therapy, medication, whatever, you know, they can live a productive life. You know, some people that did it and, and survived it, like, man, I can't believe I was in that bad of a state. Like, right. I would, you know. Did you um, have any of those people come in and talk during therapy? Someone who actually tried to take their life and, and survived? No, 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 none of none, none of that. But I just would watch stuff online about that stuff and just, you know, I just want to learn everything about it because I didn't know anything about suicide. What's the thing that from like going to the group therapy? I think it's awesome that you met strangers out on the road and went to lunch with them. And I hear you, it healed you too. Yeah. Or helped heal you too. But um, what's the thing that stands out from those meetings about suicide? Like what's... What do you remember most about those? They, I forget the saying. Because you're saying shit like people's, my son committed. Oh, but like dude, I would children, come in, so I'm, like, I'm oh. five months in. 
and I'm getting a little better. And all of a sudden, this new woman comes in. She goes, my 18-year-old son just committed suicide four days ago. And I'm like, it's fu- it was so heavy, man. I was like, I, I stopped going after about six months. I couldn't take it anymore. It was so fucking devastating to hear these new stories. new people are constantly new coming, people in, coming in. It never in. ends. Never ends. You know, and you see this mother just falling apart, telling her story, because that's it's almost like an A meeting. Tell mm-hmm. your story. It's going to be better if you talk about it and everyone's comments on it or whatever like that. It's, you know, so it was like, oh, man, this is so about six months. But basically they said it's a temporary, I forget what this word, the, the phrase is. It's a temporary solution to a permanent problem. Mm-hmm. It's just temporary. It's going to go away. You know, so it's just like, but in that moment, that's that's all they cared about. Right. You know? And it's just what they're going through, the torture that they're going through. You know, look, some people aren't made for this earth. They're just not. You know what I mean? It's just too painful for them. And I get that, you know, but it's like it affects everybody around them, mm-hmm. everybody that knew them. And they they really don't think it does. You know, and that's that, that's the hard part to understand. It's a, it's a weird death, you know, and it's like, you know, you get to the point where like, no, she didn't do it because she was mad at you, you know, because you were with it or whatever. It was just that she need that was it. It was a life. I remember going to a therapist. He goes, listen. Chapter three was the root of the problem. Uh, you were chapter three in her life. Remember this. Chapter one was the root of the problem. You weren't there for chapter one. And that that really made sense. I always remembered that. I was chapter three. I came along in her life at, you know, mid-20s. And I gave wasn't her there. happiness. Right. And I wasn't there in the beginning when the, all the shit started, you know, in chapter one of her life. So that helps. That really helps. Like, okay, so it wasn't, you know. I'm not the problem. Right. She she was feeling like this from from day one. Right. You know, so. So here you are. You're a good dude, man. Here you are going to fucking therapy to help yourself to figure all this out for six months. And this fucking family that raised this girl is wanting bags in her condo. Fucking pieces of shit. Um, well, right. that's a, and that's a whole other level. You know, now you got to deal with that. Right. I mean, so you're lawyers, dealing with the, Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's two and, years of nonstop. So let me ask you this then. In that two years, you're also a fucking man who needs some love. When When do you start dating? About eight months. Eight months. And it was fun, weird because I was talking about the Howard Stern. I go on the show and I tell my story and then we go to break. Like, holy shit. Like, we come back and then Howard's like, hey, Robin Quivers, the sidekick. Hey, Jim's single. You're single, right? Because she just got a relationship. That's right. You went out with Robin. And that's what that. She's it, a Baltimore. I'm Baltimore. She's a yeah, Baltimore, Baltimore Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Artie Lang's there. Artie Lang's my buddy. That's He's right. the sidekick. So now, to, now it completely changes. We're busting balls. Hey, Jim will go see. Go. You can go see Ozzy with Jim. You can wear, you know, whatever. Like, you know, I'm just a heavy metal dude, white trash dude from Jersey, you know. And um, and they're like, yeah, whatever. Like, come on, why you're single? He's single. Why not go on a date? And then oh, at one point, she goes. I go, yeah, I go, come on, I'll take you to friggin', you know, I'm just making jokes, Chipotle and whatever, you hang on my dirtbag friends, watch football on Sunday, gamble. And she goes, all right, fine, I'll go out with you. I'll, I'll go on a date with you. And I'm like, holy shit, really? I'm like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And then we wound up dating for, I don't know, like eight months after that. That's how you know, we were that? friends first. It was great because I yeah. think at that point in my life, and I think maybe she did, she just got to have a long relationship. I think we just needed companionship. I needed a companion. You know, and we just go we'll go meet, and we just we were friends for a while. You know, and ultimately, you know, as a comic, and were you, you able to stay friends after you guys stopped seeing each other? And stuff? Um, a little bit friendly, it, friendly. Yeah. I was on the show a few more times. Mm-hmm. I think we're still good, but you know, you know, you never really stay f- super friendly yeah. with an ex. But ultimately, you know, look, I'm a comic. You're a comic. You just I, every weekend I'm working. I can't. And she works during the week, you know, gets up at 4.30 in the morning. Their hours are crazy, Crazy. Yeah. And then on my weekend, that's when they have off. It, it, it's from day one. I had a great girlfriend I probably should have married when I first started doing comedy. And she's like, I want you around. I'm like, I can't. This is when I work. So ultimately that ended the relationship because I was still like, oh, I still want to do the funny bone in St. Louis. I'm sorry. I still, I still, I, I'm not going to just stop. And I understand. And I can't see you during a week. If I did, you know, she'd have to go to bed early. We get the so it was, it was. I knew it was going to come to a head at some point because of that, and she was getting frustrated. And I, I get it. You know, this lifestyle isn't for for everyone. No, it's not. Yeah. And so, how was it? How was it having companionship? I mean, that's also different too, because you're going from 
you know, an unknown regular civilian to fucking rob and quivers. No, I know. And that's when they had I like that. I mean, that's that. jumping in the deep end. And bro. they had like the Howard Stern uh, news crew, the yeah. news or whatever, following you around. So they were like, one of the guys like, all right, if you see Robin and Jim together, call this hotline. So then people are calling ah, in. Oh, shit. Oh, so yeah, you guys so can't go to dinner out dude, in one New time, York, One right? time I had to take her to Applebee's. <laughs> Because no one would look for you there? No, no, because we're like down like the Jersey Shore in the wintertime. It's like empty. And that place is open. I go, listen. I go, she's like, yeah, well, fine. We'll just go there. Of course, we get spotted in there. Monday morning on the show, first oh, thing. No. Jim took you to Applebee's. Robin, come on. You got this is, you you deserve better than that. I'm sleeping. I'm getting all these messages. Like, come on, he's got to do better than that. And then I they call me on the air. I'm like, it's the only place oh, open. Damn, yeah. Yeah. It's the only place open. You, Jim Applebee's. You know who you're dating. She's got class. It's not like you. I go. I know, but I didn't know. And but meanwhile, there's spies everywhere. So everywhere we went, oh, you saw Robin and Jim. They were here. They were here. They were at the movie. All that stuff. So, and I, I'm not like that. I'm a low key guy. Yeah. That's why I never moved to Hollywood. I don't. I don't want to hang out with celebrities. I don't give a shit. I've hung with them before. It's not that much fun. So I'm not that guy at all. So all of a sudden, I was getting spot. I'm like, this sucks. I don't want to be frigging paparazzi or just you know fans yeah. going there. They were here. A hotline. All that shit. So. Um, but you know what? It was really, I think we both needed each other at that point in our lives. I think she needed companionship to get over. She, she knew what you getting, were going through. She sat there and listened to you tell the whole fucking story. She did. She yeah. had no, yeah, exactly. And I, I needed that at the time. And ultimately, I mean, that's an interesting thing though. I feel like even though it only lasted what it lasted and why it lasted, but you're right. You know, here's, you don't have to tell the story at all. This is a woman coming in knowing exactly what the fuck you've been going through for the last two fucking years with it. Yeah. Yeah, or eight months, excuse me. Right, and, she, start- and you know, she knew me from the show because I would sit in all right. the time. So, you know, we so were- So she knew you. It wasn't she knew like me. this stranger, I'm going to just, hey, that guy looks like a good dude. Right. Now you got to tell her the story. Right, so, uh, but I really think, I did, like, looking back, it was a perfect time for us. Yeah. You know, it was a little moment in time, you know, but I think we both needed each other at that point. We all know the system isn't working. Thanks to Crowd Health, we can do something about it. Open enrollment is here, and that means now is the time to take charge of your health care decisions. Crowd Health has a better way to fund your health care costs. See any doctor you want, no deductibles, exclusions, or co-pays. Only pay the first $500 of any health care event. The Crowd Health community takes care of the rest. No exclusive doctor networks, no huge premiums or high deductibles, no surprises. Your monthly subscription helps fund healthcare costs of the entire Crowd Health community. Crowd Health provides true peace of mind, something insurance companies don't seem to care about. And unlike insurance companies, Crowd Health helps you find great care at a fair price, always pays doctors as quickly as possible, and actively negotiates to keep costs down for everyone. Take charge of your health care today with Crowd Health. Open enrollment is the only time you can hit eject on the broken system without penalty, so don't wait. And for a limited time, join for just $99 a month for your first six months when you use promo code HONEYDEW at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com, promo code HONEYDEW. Crowd Health is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for health care. Terms and conditions apply. You've probably heard by now that you should be using a VPN when you connect to the internet. If you knew how easy it is to protect your connection with ExpressVPN, you'd be doing it already. ExpressVPN is the easiest way to browse safely, securely, and just better. First of all, it's blazing fast. Lots of other VPNs slow your connection, but ExpressVPN doesn't lag or buffer. You can stream in high def with no issues. And using it couldn't be easier. Just open the ExpressVPN app, click one button, and enjoy instant protection across all your devices. The fact is, once you connect to ExpressVPN, you don't even realize you have it on, but your connection is secure, your data is encrypted, and you can spoof your location so you can have access to content available outside your region. No wonder it's been called the best VPN by CNET. Right now, go to expressvpn.com slash honeydew and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash honeydew to get three extra months of ExpressVPN. expressvpn.com slash honeydew. Now, let's get back to the dip. And you have know. you dealt with um, any other suicide in your life? No. No, she's the only one. She's the only one, yeah. And but you, you, go ahead. But, you know, I, I like I, I took a course on it, so I know. Wow, like, you someone, really dove into it, huh? 
It was an online course. Come on. Still, yeah. most people just go about their fucking no, I day know. doing No, because I was like, hey, man, if I, I just had a friend, a good friend. She just posted something on Twitter the other day. I'm friends with her and her dad. And she's like, I just was in a facility. I wound up trying to kill myself, whatever. I'm feeling better. I was away for a month. And I just we just talked on the phone yesterday. And I called her. She's like, oh, my God, out of blue. Well, I don't know her that well. You know, and I'm like, are you okay? I go, can we talk? And we talked on the phone and stuff like that. She's like, that means, I'm like, yeah, because you need that. You know, but you can't say to somebody that's, you know, you, you people are going to miss you. Why would you do that? Come on. You know, that's the worst thing because they don't, they don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to them when you say that. People that love you. Does that fuel them to want to do it more? No, I don't like, think are you so. Are upsetting them or they but just can't not, relate. That, that language just doesn't connect. Doesn't commute. Doesn't connect. You need to go, I understand where you're coming from. I, uh, I, I, I get why you're thinking about committing suicide. I, I, I totally get it. Cause that makes them like somebody, somebody gets me. Somebody understands. I, I, I get where you're coming from. I don't blame you for thinking that absolutely what you've been through. Then how do you flip the butt part? Let's, let's get you help. You know what I mean? Don't be embarrassed. It's okay. It's a depression is a disease, just like cancer and diabetes. You think like, ah, oh, get over it, but it's a disease. I didn't know that either. I'm like, what are you depressed about? Come on. What, you got a great life, you know, but it, it is a disease and people don't realize that either. So I'm like, you know, go, let's go, let's contact your family. Let's get you some help. Why not? Don't be embarrassed. This is okay. You know, you have to talk to them like that. Then like, wow, somebody knows what I'm talking about, what I'm going through. That's a big thing. Instead of, you know, people are going to miss you. Why would you do that to your family? Just making them feel like they're not alone and that you understand where yeah, they're Yeah, you understand from. where they're coming from. That's a big thing. Like, that's how you handle it. Not the other way, which you do, which is logic goes, why would you do that? You're going to find a new boyfriend. You're going to find a new wife. And in, in a year from now, you're going to be like with somebody else. Like, this is amazing. You know what I mean? Like, but they don't see it at that moment. I was telling my, my nephew had his first crush on this girl that, you know, didn't want him. He's 21 years old. I go, dude, you know how many girls you're going to meet in your life? I go, this is, you're going to think back at this. Like, okay. Yeah. That one girl didn't want me. You're going to forget that girl. You're going to forget that girl. You you're, you're 21 years old. You're a good looking kid. You're in a band. Are you kidding oh, me? Oh God. You're yeah. about to slay. Oh, pussy. absolutely. Yeah. He's yeah. like a male yeah. model. Yeah. I go, what the fuck? Don't yeah, worry dude. about it. You got to worry about STDs and babies. That's yeah. what you need to worry exactly. about. Yeah. yeah. I go, watch what's going to happen in your life. You know, you go, oh yeah, yeah. I remember I laid like that girl when I was younger, but he's like, that. he was devastated. I go, dude, believe, I know it sucks. You're going to have to go through it. Get through it, and then and you'll get better at getting through it too. I told my son he's twelve. He's like he was he's going to sixth grade. He's liked this girl for like three years in school, and he's like, I asked her because we're going to middle school, like the last day of fifth grade. Uh, will you be my girlfriend going to the middle school? And she goes, um, I'd rather just be friends. She texts him back, and he was crying. He was upset, and I'm like, Luke, listen. I go first of all. You're going to be in sixth grade with all your friends at lunch. You go all eat lunch together. Okay. Do you want to sit at the girl the table with your girlfriend and her girl and her girlfriends, or do you want to sit with all the boys, all your friends over there messing around? Ah, and you're going to be looking over there, going, oh, "I want to be that. That's fun over there." You want to sit with your girlfriend because you're gonna. You think she's going to let you sit with them? There's no fucking way. He's like, I didn't think about that. I'm trying to break it down. Yeah. You want to be fooling around, fucking throwing food, make cracking jokes. Yeah. I go then also. I go listen. This is what how life is. 10 times you're going to get the girl you want and 10 times you're not. So this is the one time you got her. Uh, you didn't get her, but there's going to be one you're going to get. Then the other guy, then someone else is going to get it. That's just life. So this time you didn't get her. Yeah. I was just on uh, where my mom's at with Christina Pajitsky and we were talking about, she had a, uh, someone wrote in or emailed in about, um, he's a 23 year old virgin and he has incredible anxiety about, not knowing how to please a woman. And she's like, what advice would you give him? And I was like, bro, you're never going to please every woman. You're not going to mm -hmm. bat a thousand. No, you're going to fucking. Yeah. M you'd be lucky if you're 50% on it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, look at, look so at like, my advice is dive head first into that pussy and figure it out. Cause that's figure, it. That's, that's what it. you got to do. Some people are practice people for it for you as you get younger. I mean, as you get older, yeah. you know, some relationships for both parties are practice. They don't work out. You learn something from it. You move on. Hopefully you grow, be a better person, figure, find that partner. You, can work it all out with that kind of shit 
But yeah, you're going to fuck up so much. It's it's almost like a baseball player. If they three out of ten, that they, they bat three hundred. That's Hall that's, of Fame. You're 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 an all star. You failed seven out of ten. <laughs> yeah. You got the three. I go. I was looking at it. it's a numbers game. That's it. And listen, you're going to meet some ladies who are like, you don't know how to fucking give a hand job, or you know what I mean. You're Absolutely. Like, no, just get out of here. Yeah, they're not all going to bat a thousand for you either. There's yeah. no way. No, yeah, no. I know, but it's tough, man. You know, when you're growing up, you're awkward. You're socially awkward. You yeah. don't know how to talk Insecure. to girls. I was insecure. I was all like that. I was grew up strict Catholic. I was, you know, I'm going to go to hell if I masturbate, if I have oh, sex, all that stuff, you yeah. know. So Me I too. had all that shit going on too in my head. So when I used to have sex with a girl when I was, I would take my Jesus cross off and stick it in my sneaker and throw the sock in there so Jesus couldn't see us having sex. I felt so bad. I'm like, I'm going to burn in hell. See yeah, I'd stick, and, and stick the, the sock too. In there. Yeah, I put the cross in first and then shove the sock in. <laughs> Just so we definitely couldn't see through the sock, through the sock and the sneaker. I swear to God, I was out of my fucking mind. That's what that shit will do to you. I, I was raised Catholic too, all right. the time. Like I can't touch my own fucking dick. Fuck oh yeah, I'll burn in hell. I used to think myself all the time, I'll burn in hell for this feeling. Right, twenty one is when the first time I did it. Masturbating? Yeah. No. Yeah. How the hell did you? Okay, so I've I've talked to a lot of guys that wait till later to masturbate. I just. I don't want to say discovered it like I had a lab coat on, but I, I between the summer of fifth and sixth grade, I have two brothers. Um, I have a twin brother. We're fraternal. He gets his own room. That was my. I got the top. I got the originally the top bunk with my younger I was on brother. The top bunk too. Yeah, he was like almost four years younger, about three and a half years younger. And I'm just fucking up there on that top bunk, just nonstop. I found my dick, and I was what? So wait, was your brother on the the? He's on the bottom bunk, but but. My mom made the mistake of putting separating the two of us. Like we're we're twins. We're at that same age where right. it's all going on. She's got me in the room with my younger brother. I'm up on that top bunk jerking off every fucking night. Those beds are going know. every night. He just always complaining that I'm up there making noise or shaking the bed and stuff. And she put it together. So after we lived there one year, after that, she put me and my brother, my twin brother, back in a room together. She's like, "You are gonna go through this shit in your own." But he, did he know what you were doing up nah, there? He oh, know. Okay. And now we talk. About, right, but, but he didn't now, know. He's he just didn't like, know. Why are you up there? These beds are going. Like he's probably. This. I remember I used to be on sometime in the bottom bunk, and you put your feet put your up feet and push. Yeah, yeah push your he's like, Shut up! up. <laughs> Shut up! And I'm like, Shut Wow, up. you did it in the room. See, I, I like I said, I had the bathroom. Two I did it everywhere I could. I had the bunks, and then I had my brother on the cot and down on the floor, and I was at the top bunk. I'm like, I can't. I got no privacy. Yeah, no, I just get under the covers and go for it. Yeah, I, I was like, but but the thing I. I have learned because I only they would talk to us about these wet dreams we were going to have. These, yeah, wet, they were coming, they were coming, they were coming. Well, I only had like one or two my whole life. And what I learned later was I was talking to Dr. Drew about this like, I was releasing my fucking load right already because I was jerking off so much so early. Yeah, so I didn't get a lot of them. But I've talked to I want to say it might have been, I don't, I don't want to say, I think it was Adam Ray. I'm going to just say it. If I'm right. wrong, Adam Ray, I apologize. But he, I think it was him. He was having wet dreams like every fucking – he couldn't even sleep over people's houses. Really? He was having them so often. And I was like, were you masturbating? He's like, I wasn't. So That's, his yeah. body was kicking it out. Should have wore a condom to bed. <laughs> <laughs> he should have, dude. He said it was – I was like, your body – so did you have a lot of fucking wet dreams I don't remember. I, I just know – I'm just I, curious if your body's just getting that shit out of you. All I know is I remember the first time I had sex, I was – like I had sex before I masturbated. No. I was, I was a month away from my 18th birthday with my first girlfriend. She, we were both virgins. And I had sex and I had the condom on. I remember coming – and I ran into the bathroom. I'm like, what the hell was that? It was the weirdest oh, thing. Yeah, because you'd never come. Before. I never came before. I'm like, oh my god! And the condo was completely full. I mean, but thank God I didn't fucking drown her. <laughs> thank God it didn't burst open like <laughs> a dam. First load that of first your load. Life. <laughs> that, a, a month away from my 18th birthday. Surprised you didn't take a raft home. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, what the hell is that? Oh, my God, that's so weird. I not thought of that. I guess that would be fucking weird. Uh, I mean, I might have had a couple. Of, I can't remember. So did a girl give you a hand job before you gave yourself a hand job? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. And I remember I was 21 years old and I was drunk one night. I think probably was like making out with some girl or whatever. And nothing happened. I was blue balled. And I remember in the middle of the night drunk, masturbating. Like, I didn't even have any. I just started doing it because I was, you know, I had a heart on. And I remember in the morning, I felt so guilty. I'm like, God damn, what a loser I am. 
I remember I was DJing weddings at the time. Everyone's going to be looking at me like, what a loser. Can you believe that guy did that? I was fucking that depressed. <laughs> like they know. Remember yeah, like that? They would know. Yeah, oh yeah, over that. Like who's going to know? <laughs> yeah. Who the fuck's going to know? Right, who's going to know? They all do it. They all do it. I told this story before in a podcast, <laughs> but it's a true story. So it takes me like three days to get over it that I did that. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm already going to hell. God already saw me do it. Even though I was under the covers. And in a, he, he can still see through the, the covers. Yeah, he can. He can still, I uh, go, I went on a tear. I couldn't stop. I swear, within a week, I got bursitis in my arm, my right arm. Nuh-uh. I swear to God. <laughs> so I'm playing softball. I'm like the star player on a softball team. It's the playoffs. I go to the doctor because I can't move. It's freaking killing me. And he's like, you, you're you overusing that arm. What are you doing? I go, I, I'm a lefty. And I go, yeah, I play baseball. So he goes, yeah, whatever. But I had put my arm in a sling. And From I could jerk and all. Yeah, because I had because I had bursitis in my shoulder right here. <laughs> How much were you jerk? I like I feel a like fucking I animal. Off a lot. Like an animal. Because I never <laughs> used that right arm for oh, anything. Okay. I'm a lefty, so all of a sudden I'm doing this. And then I remember showing up for the softball field Saturday morning. So I went like Friday night because I was in pain. That bursitis hurts. And I show up in the morning, I go, I can't play. I got bursitis in my arm. My team was so mad at me. Because I, I had a, my arm in a sling for like four days. From over touching it. yourself. From yeah. <laughs> Because I just like, I'm already going to hell, so I might as well just keep doing it. I'm done. Did you guys lose that playoff? Yeah, game? they were fucking pure. I couldn't tell them why. I go, I don't know what happened. I couldn't tell me. I just started jerking off, you know? They yeah. like at 21. Yeah, like, I, I show up. I remember Saturday morning, we're all ready. Like, and I'm like, I, dude, I can't. I'm, I'm just in a sweat. I couldn't even pinch hit. Oh, dude, that's so good, man. That's so good. All right, I, I want to, uh, we're going to get you out of here, but I want to, uh, first of all, thank you for talking about this. And, yeah. and if anyone out there is struggling, please get help. Um, is, I, I want to say there's a new, isn't there a new suicide number? Um, 988, I feel like there's a new number. It's a, it's a, I don't know what it is, it's but not it's a nine, It's like a 911, but not that. Right, it's an easier, and that's a that's a good thing to talk to somebody because those, those people are trained to talk to you over right. the phone. On what to say, like I was saying before, and all that stuff, like don't do it, all that stuff. So that, you know, yeah, I mean, look, people are in despair, especially with the social media. Man, you get, you know, everybody's bragging about what they're doing. Some guy's sitting at home, going, "Man, everyone else is having fun. I'm not." Meanwhile, you know, well, that's what this show's all about. That that I'm gonna look right here. That's bullshit. It's everyone's sports center. Our our social media is everyone's right. highlights, and that's why I'm saying like. That's not what really is going on in everyone's it's life. It's one hour. It's That's one why I like to sit right here and talk about what's really going on in people's lives. Nobody's right. putting a fucking suicide thing on goddamn IG. You know what I mean? Like, we're good. No. No, because it's showing the one hour of fun they're having a day. That's they right. don't show them when they're doing the dishes or freaking just, you know, doing or laundry. Or struggling with someone who's suicidal in their home or right. a partner that... that just died or, or chi- any of it. Yeah. So yeah. then, so then these people are home and look at, wow, look at everyone else having fun. I'm a loser. I'm not having any fun. Right. Everybody else, they didn't invite me. How come they're at the show? How come they didn't invite me? I'm home and because they see all that shit. So that wears on people too, you know? So it, it's, we're not in a good spot, but if, if people, I really think that like they should teach this shit in school. You know, yeah. the suicide. And forget the stupid math that you're never going to use. Agreed. You know what I mean? Teach. I this learned shit. how to write a check. We don't even use checks anymore. Exactly. Yeah, Teach I remember. That. That's the one thing I remember yeah. from from right? school. I had to write a check. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you put in the memo. What's it for? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Tell, help people. Yeah. <laughs> help people. I mean, it really. You know. So this episode's going to help a lot of people. This is a great episode. Thank you. I know this is not easy to talk about. Yeah, no, I know, but I just, uh, you know, I, I figured, yeah, if it can help somebody, why not? It's I went through it. I, I got to the other side. It's I still, think you're going to get a lot of Sixteen years love. later, it still, it still haunts me. That's yeah. But you know, it's like, hey, you at some point, you gotta, you know. Do you ever dream about her? You yeah, ever, you do. Yeah. What sort of dreams do you have? Is she talking? Is she happy? Yeah. 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 She's talking. She's happy. You know, I see her. We're going to concerts. We go to concerts a lot. So yeah, I still have the dreams about her. Yeah. Where do you park in those fucking dreams at the concert? Please, right? front row. <laughs> front row. All right. I want to ask you, um, adv- after what we've talked about now, advice you'd give to your 16-year-old self. Stop trying to save people. You can't save people. You're not God. You could do your best. That's it. If someone's damaged, they're going to be damaged. You can try to help them, but you're not ultimately going to save them. And that that's not your burden or responsibility. You could be there for him as a friend and all that stuff, but you're not, you're not going to fix it. You, you know, there's damage that was done from the childhood. 
that needs to be repaired. Chapter whether through, one. Chapter one through therapy or something like that. So don't think you're just going to and keep it's it's wearing. You know what I mean? If, if someone if you see that, it's like, you know what? That person's not right for me. I don't I don't I can't have that in my life. That's not my responsibility, even though it sounds mean. I got to find someone that's more grounded to where I could have a good life because it's very stressful living with someone like that. So just don't think you could save people because you can't. You could try to help them and that's it. That's all you could do. But don't think you're going to be the savior coming in and all of a sudden they're going to be better because you know what you're doing because you don't. As the, this is great. I really appreciated uh, sitting here listening to you. Yeah, man. No Um, problem. Yeah. Plug away again, everything, please. I got a podcast. Everybody is awful. Wherever you get podcasts, my new comedy special, Bite the Bullets, on Amazon Prime. And then I got a new prank call CD, Terrorizing Telemarketers. I mess with telemarketers. I'm on volume seven. I've been doing, <laughs> I've been doing it for 20 years. I've never grown up. So if you like prank calls where I, and I turn the tables on the telemarketers, it's out there wherever you listen to uh, music. Thank you, brother. Thanks. I appreciate uh, you having as me. As always, on, Ryan Sickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We'll talk to you all next week.